positive about, about giving the green light for, for the firm to look at the Ghanaian situation. And tonight, Ghana faces danger of losing its lifeline mineral resources, including cocoa, bauxite, and oil, to the People's Republic of China. President Ecufado says he is confident a bailout from the International Monetary Fund with China on board will help the country restructure this controversial debt arrangement, which has got many Ghanaians worried. If implemented as planned, this program will really help us not only dealing with the crisis but get out of the crisis and really lay the foundation which is exactly what you're talking about we have details as the resident imf representative warns ghana's current economic crisis will only be resolved if government is able to stick to the reforms and conditions spelt out in this three billion dollar support program And Top Story, as always, is brought to you by Vodafone. Further together and blessed to God. And tonight, President Kufuadu has forcefully jammed to the defense of the role of China played in Ghana securing the International Monetary Fund deal amidst reports the global power may have the reason for the delay uh, may have been the reason for the delay in accessing this three billion dollar support program uh, this comes on the heels of a revelation by the international monetary fund that four collateralized loans from china exposed the country to losing part of its mineral resource revenue in addition to electricity sales should they Come, should there be a, a default in this debt arrangement? The approval of Ghana's $3 billion bailout package from the International Monetary Fund was predominantly contingent on China's participation in the external debt restructuring talks. Uh, my colleague, Isaac Kofia J, has been studying this report and will be joining me in studio for a chat on the implications of this uh, loans. But first, take a listen to President Akufuadu. Uh, China is the biggest bilateral creditor to Ghana. Uh, what were discussions like with them? I mean, well, did they contribute well, to part of the delay? Yes, no, no. I think that China, China took a very uh, positive, proactive role. They co-chaired the official creditor committee. It was the final hurdle that we had to overcome before being able to go to the fund. It was when the creditor committee met, I believe, they co-chaired it with Paris, as I believe they met on the 11th of May, uh, and China was extremely positive about, about giving the green light for, for the firm to look at the Ghanaian situation positively. Though I, I don't have any uh, uh, hesitations or any criticisms about the Chinese involvement in the Ghanaian. The Chinese involvement in the Ghanaian economy, my large, has been very, very helpful. I know that there are it's, it's a, a matter of controversy in the West about China, China, China. But for us, they have been s strong friends, and in the time of this difficulty, they proved to be strong friends. So I, I'm Do you think the controversy has been overplayed then? <laughs> We're talking about competition amongst big powers for influence and for... Uh, uh, and uh, the, the controversy will be generated out of that fact alone. The competition is, is bound to... To, 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 to stimulate a lot of, a lot of controversy. So there it is. I, I, I don't think it, it, it's of, of particular value to go, it's a fact that we have to deal with. Well, we deal with it on the, on the, on the, on the principle that our economy, our politics, our country has historically been one that has been outward looking, that has insisted on as much as possible uh, friendship, with all, with all those who want to be friendly with Ghana, the certain principles that have been important to us. But beyond that, we have attempted to be friendly with all, all countries. China is 
Uh, and that's the position of President Akufado in all of this. Uh, the nation itself, as we speak, has received at least $600 million uh, with government indicating that it will be using the money to show up the Bank of Ghana's reserves and budgetary support. There, however, uh, concerns about whether the program will take Ghana out of the current economic challenges. Resident Representative Dr. Leandro Medina is confident an effective implementation can achieve this. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that sound for you shortly, uh, but my colleague Isaac Kofia J is joining me in studio uh, with, uh, of course, uh, a lot to un uh, unpack about this whole loan arrangement uh, with China. Kofi, let's get to it. Uh, what does the report say about, first of all, this collateralized loan as of 2022 and the associated implications uh, should we default? Mm. So, Blazer, let me take you to page 52 of the IMF program, it says Ghana's collateralized debt is entirely held by China. Uh, this is as a result of four loans agreements we signed in 2007 uh, to 2018 mm -hmm. that amounted to 619 million US dollars uh, to finance infrastructure projects. Uh, these are collateralized against commodity production, and they listed these commodities cocoa, bauxite, and oil, and even electricity sales now let's go to page 44 of the same document and this is what the imf says about um, um collateralized loans yes. so according to the imf a debt is collateralized and when the creditor has the rights over an asset or revenue stream that will allow it if the borrower defaults on its payment obligation mm. to rely uh, uh, on the asset or revenue stream to secure repayment of the debt. Uh, and Kofi, I believe the IMF is adding this to provide context absolutely uh, to, to the point about default. Uh, there's also uh, some more revelation about Ghana owing four countries some 3.2 billion US dollars. Give us the details then. So these four countries, let's categorize them. First, we look at the Paris Club countries. The IMF listed two countries. First one is Belgium. We owe Belgium 437 million US dollars. United Kingdom, UK, 430 million dollars. Now let's look at the non Paris clubs. There's China, 1.9 billion US dollars, and India, 475. So if you add all of them, it's over 3.2 billion US dollars. Uh, and what has been the precedence for countries that have defaulted, I mean, their loans to China? Because that's becoming mm -hmm. a worry for many countries yeah. out there. Yeah. There are templates all around. So we can look at Sri Lanka, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Uganda. All these countries use their assets as collaterals when they sign loan agreements with China. And when they defaulted, uh, you know, the clause was triggered. Uh, and indeed, it's the reason for which many Ghanaians out there are worried and, and even skeptical about the uh, ability of the IMF program itself to resuscitate Ghana's economy. Mm. Uh, we can take a listen to the resident rep for uh, the IMF, Dr. Leandro Medina, uh, who is confident that an effective implementation of the policy can achieve this. This program is very strong on really the objectives and the policies and reforms that are needed. So again, if implemented as planned, this program will really help us not only dealing with the crisis, but get out of the crisis and really lay the foundation, which is exactly what you are talking about, right? Doing the transformation so then you can have a, a, a more sustainable and, 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 and long-lasting inclusive growth, you know, ensuring uh, social protection is a key aspect mm -hmm. of uh, the uh, program. Eh? Let me be clear. In times of crisis, it's not uncommon that the uh, expenditure as a whole uh, is reviewed and the different uh, initiatives are, are being reviewed to make them a more uh, cost uh, efficient. So uh, this is what is it, going into that. Uh, how that donor is going to come on board? To so the, uh, Extended credit facility, as I mentioned, is a, is a, is a program to, 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 to support, uh, financially support uh, the needs of, of countries in, in, in difficulty. And one very important dimension of this type of program is the, ro the role, uh, as, uh, the catalytic role in uh, securing uh, you know, foreign aid and, and, and foreign financing. Uh, in this, in this uh, sense, the role of donors 
of you know, development partners and other multilaterals is, is, is very key. And we really expect them to come uh, on board. And there are some of them that are already working on, on, on the different initiatives that they have. The external creditors negotiations and all the rest. I mean, some are saying that it remains very critical to the success of this program and even passing some of the program reviews. As I said before, this is a, a comprehensive uh, debt operation that includes different types of creditors, right? It includes the domestic debt, it includes the external uh, bilateral, and it includes the external uh, commercial. Uh, what I can say, the uh, domestic front has been largely uh, concluded. Uh, the uh, external front, which is, I think, what you, what you refer to, it has two components, right? The bilateral and the uh, commercial. On the bilateral front, we have received uh, assurances in the context of the uh, G20 Common Frame, right? The official creditor committee was formed and uh, co-chaired by uh, China and France have provided the assurances. So that is, is very promising. Uh, on the uh, commercial front, the authorities are uh, discussing with their creditors and also uh, the progress is being made and we expect also, uh, you know, Uh, and that's the uh, position of the resident rep for the IMF, Dr. Leandro Medina, speaking uh, to my colleague, George Wefe. Of course, a lot more in that interview for you later on the Joy News channel uh, on PM Express. But it's time now to bring in coordinator of the TED World Network, Dr. Yao Graham, and uh, also the director for the Center for Asian Studies, uh, Dr. Lloyd Amma, who are all joining us in this conversation. I thank you, gentlemen, for your time here on Top Story. Uh, Dr. Graham, the, the problem that many third world countries uh, have been facing, uh, the issue about the Chinese debt trap, as the, as the Western world would term this. Uh, but it's becoming a reality in our case. How should we be treading cautiously in this in these trying times? Well, first of all, we, I mean, we need to define what exactly we are calling the Chinese debt trap because it's a term that we can throw around very yeah, easily. So and when you say the Chinese debt trap, what precisely are we talking about? Uh, but then you, you find a situation where our lifeline mineral resources, uh, for instance, cocoa, bauxite, uh, oil, all <laughs> being collateralized uh, out of this uh, arrangement that we're having. If the debt restructuring does not go at the creditor committee level because we're not setting right now what China will commit to, that will mean that all of these resources will be gone. No, I think that's a completely alarmist, alarmist and misrepresentation of reality. I've read the way in which the except in the IMF document has been lifted, you know, and elaborated. First of all, let's agree that China is the single biggest bilateral creditor. So China is an important creditor. So its commitment to the bilateral group to negotiate with Ghana I think is an important development. However, the issue of what would happen or not happen to our debt, the largest group of creditors with whom we have not even begun to have any conversation mm -hmm. yet are the private international creditors who also even if things are not collateralized have a claim if we default you know there was an incident some years ago when a voucher fund which had bought argentinian debt on the open market and seized an argentinian boat from tama harbor it wasn't collateralized but they had a judgment that became an enforced so, you, so the, the thing about things being seized, they are steps there. But I think that the thing about collateralizing, before we even get to assets being seized, there are so many sources from which the Ghana government can take steps to pay debts which are owed. So I think in, in discussing these things for the public, we should also take some responsibility to do some education. Mm, and that's exactly what we've done. Arise yeah. from owing to the steps to the steps. Mm. So to jump to this conclusion, because all the creditors could seize Ghanaian assets. Yes, and and, and, 
and, and that's why we're, we're raising the possibility of China doing that. In fact, the IMF document points to that. I, I just want my colleague no, uh, Isaac to, to read out. Large, uh, if, you, if, you if you would indulge, if you if you would indulge me, Doc, Doc uh, let, let's yeah. read out what the document says about this particular yeah, situation. The, 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 the loans you are talking about are not collateralized against assets. They are collateralized against commodity production, revenue streams, cocoa, bauxite, oil, and even sales from electricity. Yes. And, and that's the, what the, the document the, is telling us. The, but the stream, the income stream, the income stream is a source of revenue, which they want to guarantee that we pay. So when you, you move from there to say they will seize the assets, we are misrepresenting the terms of the thing. We've never said the assets will be seized, but if you do have a collateral, uh, the IMF mm. document is possibly pointing so out to IMF, what, what, what may, may happen. The thing is about revenue stream. Yes. So what is the problem that we are talking about here? Uh, Dr. Lo understand the problem. Uh, Dr. Do Dr. Lloyd Amoy is also joining us. Uh, he's with yeah. the he's the director for the Center for Asian Studies. Uh, Doc, you, you've been listening to Dr. Yao Graham as well. Um, touch on this point about uh, China not necessarily having the ability as of now to to seize or perhaps take over these assets. Uh, but from your perspective, looking at what we have said and what the IMF is raising about committing these resources in 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 a form of a uh, a debt arrangement, that could be detrimental to the country. You agree? Um, of course, I, I get the angles that, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Graham is presenting in terms of the nitty-gritty, the legal questions, how it is that if China decides on our default to, to you know, take control of these uh, collateralized assets you are talking about, that there will be steps. But beyond the, the finesse of all of that, and, and, and of course, the, the serpentine reality the fact remains, to be brutally frank, that, that when we, we play, these resources would, would, would be taken control over by the Chinese. In fact, the, the data that I have, I mean, uh, from, from very, very credible sources in terms of similar realities with other countries. In fact, the issue of Laos has come up very recently uh, regarding the danger uh, um, in, in terms of their engagement with China, they are building this interesting uh, road uh, under the BRI. And, and, and the analysis shows the, the danger in there. Uh, in case that the processes do not uh, go through uh, in terms of what is envisioned for the project, the loans that have been taken, uh, obviously Laos is going to face problems. We've seen this with Sri Lanka, the port. Uh, and all of that. We've seen that with, with the Zambian case, you know. So um, when we cut to the case, we face an obvious uh, potential uh, of, of, of losing these resources. Of course, in the discourse, it's important to more or less provide, a, you know, a nuanced view uh, of, of how this will come about beyond an alarmist kind of, 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 of presentation of the reality. But the truth remains that, that we owe, uh, and we are trying to deal with, 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 with this uh, debt on our necks. And the Chinese angle, you know, because of all the loans that we took between 2007 and 2018 to finance uh, 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 infrastructure projects, and the ways in which these loans were more or less fashioned out, there's a sense in which given the pressure of, of the debt we face and, and all of that, that if, if we don't hold our side of the bargain, then, then we face the real uh, uh, possibility of, of China calling in this collateral. You know, so I, I, will, be, I will be blunt with the, with the fact mm. uh, uh, and, and say it as it is. To, to be and, sure. in, and in fact, here at Joy News, what, what we've been attempting to do is to look, take it by a Kesri uh, analysis mm. looking at what's been happening uh, to each loan that we've contracted and Isaac Kofiaje is with us uh, the, the repository tells us the yeah. picture yeah. how stark it is in terms of what we've done and what we've committed uh, let's let's get to some examples then uh, and and let's put that to mm. uh, the gentleman we have on, on the so, so, so let's start from 2007 when we took 
306 million from China to build the Bui Power hydropower project, uh, a 400 megawatt power project. We use cocoa exports as the collateral. And then in 2012, when we took, let's go to 20, uh, 2009, for instance, uh, there was a technical cooperation. And then also the, in 2012 as well, we took uh, 75 million from China for the same Bui Power project. Okay. We use cocoa as collateral. In 2012, again, Bui Power 76, cocoa was used as collateral. And then also in 2013, we took 850 million from China to do Western Corridor Gas Infrastructure Projects. Oil exports were used as collateral. Okay. 2013, again, we took 115 million US dollars for integrated national security communication. Um, oil exports uh, was used as collateral. And in 2019, very recent, we took 186 million US dollars to the for the construction of 11 coastal fishing mm. landing sites. Oil revenue again as security. And also the last one in 2019, where we use bauxite mm. as collateral. And, and so, Dr. Yao Graham, you see the trend of, of how no, no, we've no. been yeah, dealing no, with I China over the years. Actually, the point I was, I was going to make a secondary point that revenue flow, I mean, the, the kind of what you call a resource for infrastructure has been a feature of Chinese lending. That's a fact. What I was actually coming to is that in the framework of where we are now, I think it's progress that the Chinese have submitted to being part of a group of creditors. And I think we need to pay some attention to this. Because part of the reason why the Chinese has tended to be an outlier is that there's no multilateral debt resolution mechanism. And the Paris Club, historically, was the only was a group of Western countries. So with China now having become a big lender to developing countries, it is quite significant that they've agreed to be part of this, submitted to a framework where they have to be like others in going forward. But coming back home, I think the lesson to take from this Okay, it's our own governance. The list that you have read, how could any responsible government pile up commitments to securitize borrowing for security infrastructure with our export earnings? A dam, it's a productive asset, which you can argue that we generate a revenue stream and so on. So in discussing the threat or otherwise arising from collateralization, I think the more important lesson we should be discussing as Ghanaians is the absolute lack of accountability for the terms that our governments borrow on, the uses which they put the money, the results that they do not show, and the complicities of our parliaments in allowing these things to happen. So in, in this moment when citizens' savings have been seized by the government, because the treatment of citizen creditors to the government is completely discriminatory compared to his readiness to negotiate with foreign creditors. Pensioners are marching up and down because their assets, their, invest, their savings have been seized. I think the, 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 the responsibility for this situation we should discuss in terms of the domestic accountability, which the consequence of which we are focusing on. Indeed. So rather than focusing on the consequence, I think we should be learning lessons because I was speaking to your, your person earlier. I said every major power in this world is doing a deal with China. The Russians are discussing a new pipeline. I'm sure they will take care of their interests. The Europeans buy 99% of their solar uh, power investment equipment from the Chinese. They are taking steps to protect themselves. So when we come here and talk about the threat China poses to us, we should be asking who in this country put the country's head in the mouth of the Chinese dragon and discuss future lessons to avoid a repetition of the impunity, the abuse of power, the corruption, and the waste and the lack of accountability which 
responsible for them. And this is an exercise that you in academia will continue to do. Let me give the final words to um, the director uh, at the Center for Asian Studies, Dr. Lloyd Amar, uh, the way forward and how we could possibly avert this. For now, we've not been able to get an exact commitment from the Chinese government. Uh, would you want our government to bring to bear uh, diplomacy, engage China some more, so we're certain that these loans would not set upon us? Well, I mean, for sure. I mean, uh, the news that came out uh, indicated that the Chinese obviously were interested in talking. They had joined the committee. But we still do not have the details in terms of what the Chinese are bringing to the table. Um, and so we need to be clear about, about that. But obviously, there are broader questions uh, regarding the way we've been running our policy, the way in which we've been handling uh, 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 the economy and, and all of that. And this debt obviously has imposed, you know, extreme hardships on, on the masses of our people and on all of us. Um, inflation, for example, has gone, you know, to the roof 50%, now about 40 Standard of living is falling. The cost of living is, is going up. And so these, these are big questions that, that, that need to, to be looked at. This system of governance we are running, the, those who run the country, the political, uh, you know, uh, elite, the bureaucracy, uh, you, know, uh, you know, all of us, in, in a sense, who have responsibility. The question remains whether um, we have executed the, 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 the trust that was reposed in, in or that has been reposed in, 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 in those who have responsibility. And it seems as if it's not the case. And I think that the IMF, too, I mean, when you look at, at, at the press release, it's as if it's repeating the same issues that were raised in 1983 in, in a way that is almost laughable. I mean, there's something about the tools of, of, of running our economy that we are not even addressing at the fundamental level. And so long as we don't do that and we keep papering over these key fundamental questions, uh, I think that we might yet be coming back to the same issues mm. 20 years from now. And, and I think that is the pain and the anguish that mm. one, 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 one more or less is forced to, to, to feel when, when these things come up. Yes. Uh, it's instructive that we're having this conversation on the Africa Day uh, where four bears wish that at this point we should be moving towards self-reliance but unfortunately that's not the trajectory i'm grateful to the director at the center for asian studies dr lloyd amwan and also to you dr yao graham of the ted world network for sharing your thoughts with us that's it for top story i am blessed to news night comes up shortly ever visited a shop picked a whole basket of provisions toiletries and very essential things you need battled a long queue to finally pay only to be told <laughs> you can't pay to a merchant number the way that thing they pay eh? but with vodafone cash there is no problem <laughs> Now, on Vodafone Cash, you can pay all merchants on all networks. Easy peasy. And you straight. And you direct. And you sharp. From your Vodafone Cash wallet to any merchant's number on other networks. So, whether you are buying provisions or fuel, medication or food, whatever the service or need, just pay conveniently from Vodafone Cash to any merchant's number. Simply dial star 110 hash to make payment to merchants on other networks today. Vodafone. Wouldn't you prefer an apartment hotel? One that offers the utmost convenience of a boutique hotel while offering the idyllic comfort of your own private home. Oasis Park Residences offers luxury studios, one, two and three bedrooms both for short and long term rental at competitive rates. A sky swimming pool, gourmet outdoor restaurant and a fully equipped gym rest on a breathtaking rooftop with panoramic views of the city. Oasis Park Residences, located at Shiashi, Tetekwashi, 10 minutes from the International Airport, is the ideal place for all your accommodation needs. Why don't you give us a call on 020-4343-009 or visit our website at oasisparkresidences.com to make your reservations. Oasis Park Residences, more than a home. My name is Nanama McBrown. Many people think I get what I want anytime because I am popular. <laughs> no, that is not true. It is because me and Kasano, I like the best. And when I find it, I stick to it. I have found Bell Pack T-Roll and I'm stuck with it. 
It is soft but not weak, strong but not hard. It is just perfect. Bell Pack T Roll is smooth and gentle on the skin. Same as Bell Pack Kitchen Towel. It cleans in one wipe. You can soak, squeeze, and clean again. One Bell Pack Kitchen Towel lasts longer and saves you money. It's time you switch to Bell Pack today and experience the perfect paper tissue. Say your pocket tissue, table napkins, tea roll, and a kitchen towel. If I show, Bell Pack is simply the best. Bell Pack, just perfect. To be a Bell Pack distributor, call 055-114-4400. Another quality product from Bell Aqua. Nothing feels so good like Bell Pack. During a shopping experience, does your heart beat fast when you make a payment? Followed by a tight squeeze in your chest when you receive a debit alert? Then you suddenly get sweaty when you see what's left in your account? <laughs> now, you can get more out of paying by tapping into rewards with Visa. Enjoy 10% cash back on 1,000 Ghana cities spend or more in at least 5 contactless transactions so you can enjoy more of the things you love. Tap to pay with Visa everywhere you want to be. Good evening and welcome to News Night. We are live on Joy 99.7 FM here in Accra. In Kumasi, we are on Love 99.5 FM. We are on a number of affiliates across Ghana's 16 regions. We are on Twitter Spaces. We are on Facebook, myjoyonline.com. In the next 60 minutes here on News Night, tonight, National Food Buffer Stock Company disputes 18 months arrears claims by food suppliers who are threatening to hold supplies to the various senior high schools. We have details as they issue a 14 days ultimatum to government to settle the debt or they will understand leash they're off. So I don't think they are expecting we the suppliers to bring the food. You're basically yes. telling us you're not doing that. With what capacity? What are we going to go into the hinterland with? We are going to go with money. We'll get to hear from the National Food Buffer Store Company which assures debts will be settled to avoid food shortages on campuses. I'm getting the support of government. Government is doing everything possible to make sure that food issue, how to resolve it once and for all. So yes, my hands are tight but thankfully uh, government is giving me the needed and the necessary support. Meanwhile, at the junior level, see, school feeding caterers are still on strike for over a month now. We have details of it, and Supreme Court cites NDC's Professor Michael Kwesa White for contempt over his recent tweet, which the court believes affects its dignity. We have details as he apologizes even before the day he is to show up. Also tonight, the Ghana Bar Association calls for government intervention in the ongoing strike by members of the Judicial Service Staff Association of Ghana that has brought justice delivery to its knees. We, we have to find a way of resolving so that these people can come back. The major players in this game is government and JUSAC. They have to go back and see whatever must be done. Because as to what the grievances are, we have nothing to do with it. Meanwhile, hundreds of litigants have been left stranded across the country as the strike bites hard. Completely frustrated because now you don't even know when your, 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 your case is coming on. Some of us have dates for trial. In my case, for example, I have to travel but because of the case, I'm here. In business, government misses out on meeting total revenue and grants target for first quarter of this year. And in sports, former world champion Joshua Clotter bemoans the work ethic of young boxers, fearing it might jeopardize the future of the sport in Ghana. And much later, labeled as a spirit child because he has cerebral palsy and denied food for three days by a native doctor. That's the story of five-month-old baby Kelvin, who is now battling for his life. <laughs> I am appealing for help in any form to cure my baby. I am told that such medical conditions, if not properly handled, may lead to the baby having mental challenges in the future. So I need everybody's help. We are live in Nadoli Kaleo district of the Upper West Region shortly. And in our Schools of Shame series today, we'll take you back to Kufori, a community in the East Mampusi municipality of the Northeast Region, where education has ground to a halt following the collapse of the school building. Residents are demanding the removal of the municipal education director. That and more in tonight's edition of Newsnight. Please do all to join us with your thoughts and comments is via WhatsApp 055 I am MFA Apao.
Many thanks for your company. This is your home of independent, fearless, and credible journalism. Before we get into the issues about food shortage or the looming food shortage on SHS campuses, as well as the school feeding cage strike that has lasted over a month now, let me take you up to the Nadoli Kalio district of the Upper West Region first, where baby Kelvin was born five months ago and after a week developed cerebral palsy with seizures. He was admitted at the Upper West Regional Hospital and the condition well managed for a week before he was discharged. He was, however, labelled a spirit child by community members and not expected to survive. My colleague Rafiq Salam has more. Sitting by the bedside of baby Calvin is his mother, Emilda Kelly, who is sad and crestfallen about the turn of events. I was told that I may have made sarcastic comments or looked down on an elderly person and he's the one pulling the strings on the baby. The other thing is that baby Calvin may have been a spirit child and for that matter may not survive. I was then asked to bring the baby to my home village at Iziri for the native doctor to exercise the ghosts and spirit on him. We were told that if he is a spirited child and takes the medicine, he will die. But if he doesn't, he will be cured and will survive. They gave him the medicine after which we left. She left baby Calvin in the care of some unknown women and the native doctor. Five days later, they were called to Viziri to take baby Calvin home. They were not charged a single penny. They however met him in worse condition. He was frail, pale and weak. His back dotted with sores, his body temperature also rose. We were told he was neither given food nor water, except medicine they gave him. What is what we call pressure sores? Because they occur around the bony prominences when you are left lying in one position for a long time without turning or without getting up. You develop sores on the bony prominences. So that's what has happened to this baby. Emil de Kelle for now is confused and regret him for her actions. I'm appealing for help in any form to cure my baby. I am told that such medical conditions, if not properly handled, may lead to the baby having mental challenges in future. There is no need for um, going for alternative treatments where you would come back in a worse form that we cannot do much about. Um, I think especially for children who cannot speak for themselves, I think that parents should um, consider um, medical advice before they seek for some of these things. Reporting for VA News, Rafik Salam. Wow. Let me touch base with my colleague Rafik Salam on how baby Kelvin is doing. Rafik, uh, you've been monitoring closely baby Kelvin. Tell us about his condition. Uh, his condition uh, for now, according to the pediatrician specialist at the Apples Regional Hospital, uh, it's okay. Uh, he was uh, managed. And then the source uh, about uh, being uh, healed and they have been discharged currently. Baby Calvin is at uh, their residence at Wazungu. Mm. Well, and uh, we, we were earlier told about um, support that uh, the mother needed to be able to take care of Kelvin. How is it going? Um, the mother is at her wit ends uh, at the moment uh, because she doesn't know where that support uh, could uh, come from because... That is even part of the reason why that led her to see this native doctor or the medicine man uh, in the village at Izere. Uh, and so they are appealing to anybody who will come to their aid and then to help uh, at least uh, uh, get uh, this uh, uh, boy uh, treated. Uh, but also the information that we also glean on indicates that uh, tomorrow he's expected to be back to the hospital, uh, uh, to be back to the hospital for further uh, medication. Thank you very much, uh, Rafiq Salam, uh, for joining us with that update on baby Kelvin. Now, uh, let's get into uh, some other stories now. And the National Food Supplies Association have hinted of halting supplies of foodstuff to all senior high schools under the free SHS policy across the country. According to the association, government has failed to honor payment of outstanding arrears of 18 months, a situation that has led to the banks chasing them for their properties and assets because they are in default of loan agreement. Spokesperson for the National Food Suppliers Association, Kweku Ameduma, said if the arrears are not settled, then heads of schools should not expect food from them when schools resume because they are lacking credibility to assess loan facilities.
the expectations of them rest with the management of the policy. In fact, they are expecting management of the policy to finance all these items or activities. So I don't think they are expecting we, the supplier, to bring the food. You're basically yes. telling us you're not doing that. With what capacity? What are we going to go into the hinterland with? We are going to go with money. If we don't have the money, we need to go with credibility. And that credibility we have lost. And we have lost credibility to the point that buffer stock itself has lost credibility. Before now, you could take buffer stock's letter to a bank, and the bank will loan you to go and supply or work with buffer stock. But today, buffer stock letterhead doesn't go to the bank. The banks don't recognize buffer stock as a credible letter or contract letter upon which they could give us contract or give us facilities mm. to, to work with buffer stock. That is how low we have sunk as suppliers, mm -hmm. and that is how low buffer stock has, has sunk. You want school children to go hungry in schools because buffer stock is not treating you well? We haven't said that. We have helped the school children because our kids are also in school. Indeed, um, I have two kids. They are all benefiting from... They'll go hungry. Of course, school. they will go hungry. But compare mm -hmm. what we, the suppliers, are going through, the sustenance of the business. If you don't have money to go back into the market to bring the stuff, and you don't have the credibility to go and take it on credit, is it our fault that the children are not getting it? It is not our fault. In fact, this free SHS or school feeding, whatever, was budgeted for in the 2022 budget. So where is the money? 23, you mean? 2023 budget. Yeah, yeah, right. So where has the money gone to? That's uh, the National Food Suppliers Association spokesperson, Kweku Amedume, there speaking to my colleague, Blessed Suga, on the polls. But CEO of the National Food Buffer Stock Company, Hanan Abdul Wahab, while denying the 18 months arrears, is assuring that the debts will be settled. Trust me, look at the number of suppliers who have called for um, uh, the press conference. They are saturated. You understand? That's what I'm saying. I understand them. I'm not blaming them entirely, except the misinformation. You know, you owe somebody this amount of money, this much amount of money. How do you expect a person to continue supply? So this is what I am doing. And I'm getting the support of government. Government is doing everything possible to make sure that Chief of Staff have held a meeting on three different occasions on this food issue, how to resolve it once and for all. You understand? So, yes, my hands are tight, but thankfully, uh, government is giving me the needed and the necessary support because um, I have been able to you know, make sure that this letter left Ministry of Education to Ministry of Finance. So, one step has been achieved. Now, I'm on Ministry of Finance to process the release warrant to uh, control an accountant general. Then I can go there too. That's the last stage. And for controller, we have to also be very frank here. Controller may not be able to get a 275 million at a go. Because as and when funds come and it's available, he can call and say, this is 40, this is 50, this is 60. But maybe there may uh, be a situation where we can get everything at once. Uh, but let's not you know, bank our hopes that oh, once it goes to controller, the two say, I'll be very much happy that we can get everything, if not even everything, the exact amount that we owe suppliers for 2022 so that we can just clear everybody 100%. Then I can, I'll be vindicated. Uh, because when I am the head of this institution, when you put out something that, oh, fans have been, you are reliable income from the Ministry of Education. You don't work for Ministry of Education. You work for me. That's um, Hanan Abdul Wahab, is the CEO of the National Food Buffer Store Company, where one key stakeholder is the uh, Conference of Heads of Assisted Secondary Schools, and they are the ones uh, taking care of these children and taking stock when these supplies come in earlier. We've had them raise concern some time back about um, this looming food shortage because they were not getting the supplies. Some parent had to start providing food for their children who were in the SHS. But let me bring in uh, Dr. Clementa Park, as and when we get chats, we'll get get to them, but Dr. Clementa Park is MP for Busa South and Deputy Ranking Member on Parliament Education Committee. Well, I, I've heard you uh, talk extensively about this particular issue. Parliament may be on recess though, but I guess your committee is aware of the situation involving buffer stock and the food supplies, aren't you? Well, however, let me say good evening to you and good evening to our listeners. And uh, to indicate that I am not surprised but I believe members of the Ghanaian public would be surprised that uh, this is happening. 
I say so because government has always postured in a way that seeks to suggest that all is nice and dandy, and that those of us who have been raising these issues in the public domain are working against or do not wish the policy to succeed. Now, I must refer to the points that the leader of the Association of uh, Food Suppliers made. He is right. In 2022, the budgetary allocation for the Fishing High School was $2.3 billion. In 2023, the allocation is $3 billion. And cumulatively, if you were to look at the allocations from 2017 to 2023, it's just slightly above $12 billion. And the bulk of the monies invested to finance the program goes to the feeding of the students. So why is it that year in, year out, Government proposes a budget to finance the policy. Parliament approves, and yet we still have these sorts of challenges where we now are hearing that buffer stock food suppliers have not been paid for 18 months. And because of that, they are now encumbered in terms of their ability to continue to supply food to our wards in the secondary school. If you want my honest opinion, mm -hmm. this is yet another reason why the call for a review of the free high school policy is justified, because something just doesn't add up. And I fail to understand why government would say that this is a flagship program, a program for which big amounts of monies have been allocated and approved, and yet we are experiencing the challenges that we are talking about. And look, make no mistake, I can tell you on authority that we are already beginning to get reports from various parts of the country that some of the schools are experiencing inadequate food supply mm -hmm. or the supply of only one staple. You will remember that a school in Navrongo, the OLL Girls Model School, the students had to stage a protest because they had been fed only rice for a week in a row. So let's call on government because obviously this cannot be blamed on the buffer stock company. And I want to say that this cannot also be blamed on the Ministry of Education. Mm. This obviously must be laid at the doorsteps of the Ministry of Finance. So Akufuado ought to instruct Ken Oforiata to release the monies to the ministry for onward transfer to the buffer stock so that they can pay the suppliers for them to continue to supply food so that we do not have a situation where the students will be compelled to be sent home as a result of government's failure to meet its obligations. Well, interestingly, as a committee, we know that um, the, at the junior level, this the, this issue is not just at the, the senior level, which is the, the SHS. At the junior level, for a, a, a month now or so, we're told that the caterers that are supposed to be providing food under the school feeding program have been on strike because they've also not been paid. As a committee, I'm sure that this is also an issue that under your radar that you, you, you're actually paying attention to. Yes, we have also followed the rather unfortunate and sad situation where our world school uh, in the public business school system have not been fed the quote-unquote one hot nutritious meal per day under the school feeding program. And let me be honest in saying that while the school feeding secretariat is not housed in the Ministry of Education, by virtue of the fact that the program is supposed to entice, and for that matter, increase enrollments and ensure retention, the Committee on Education has an interest in what goes on. Yeah. And I must say that for over four weeks now, the caterers have been on strike. And the silence from the powers that be in terms of the office of the president, is quite disappointing.
because we are beginning to get reports about how the refusal of the caterers to cook, rightly so, because they are old areas, they have borrowed monies to continue to prepare the food. They are, they are, they are creditors are pursuing them. Many of them have had to go even into, into hiding. The fact that in these times that we are, uh, the 97 pesos per child per day is not even sufficient to procure an egg. I have even argued that 97 pesos is no longer sufficient to even feed a pet cat. So the legitimate demands of the school caterers ought to capture the attention of government. To think that we approved a sum of 959 million Ghana cities in the 2023 budget to finance the school feeding program. And to think that for the past four months, I mean four weeks, the women have been on strike, and yet government is not making any effort to try and address their demands for them to get back, to prepare the foods, to keep our wards in school, and to ensure that they continue to attend school. Mm. It's an indictment on mm. this government, and I think this is unexcusable. Clearly, we can summarize all of this to indicate that our educational system is seriously challenged from the very basic level all the way to the tertiary. We would find a day to speak about the challenges bedeviling tertiary, tertiary education as well. as well. Okay, we are grateful. And that's uh, Dr. Clementa Park. is a deputy ranking member on the Education Committee in Parliament. Thankfully, uh, we are the chairperson of the School Feeding Caterers Association for Greater Accra, uh, Greater Accra Region, uh, Juliana Kujo. Thank you so much uh, for your time here on Newsnight, Madam Kujo. So let me find out from you if um, the, the payment of your arrears, and uh, is there has there been any uh, progress on that? Have you been paid the, the monies that you were owed? Good evening, and good evening to your listeners. No, uh, a month ago, we met with the secretaries. I'm not feeling fine. Okay. We, we met with the secretaries, and they promised to pay the following week. So, and they said we will meet again in two weeks' time, which is on the 16th of this month. We did, we did not hear from them. So last week we called them and asked if their meeting is coming on. And they said they have postponed, postponed their meeting. Postponed it. Uh, they are going to a workshop. Mm. So we didn't hear from them again. We did not from them again. Madam Kujo, sorry for your situation, but uh, how many months are you owed under uh, the school feeding program? Pardon me, come again. I, I, I'm asking, at the last count, how many months of monies are you owed in terms of the areas? Okay, uh, second term and first term. We are now starting the third term. So it's three terms. Two terms, but we are currently uh, at the uh, three terms. Uh, and each term is about three months, right? Yes, please. Okay, and um, authorities have not said anything about when these payments oh, will be made. Okay. When we asked them, they said we are expecting some money. So in the meantime, we are not feeding our children in the schools. Is that the situation? Yeah, or you are still we cooking? don't have money. We don't have money to feed them. We don't have money. Madam Juliana, and the debtors who are on our neck, can't you see I'm sick? Because of them, when they call you, they will insult you. You don't want to pay the money. You don't want to. You are hiding. So all these things. I don't want to talk much because if I said I'll talk school feeding, I want to brush my mind from uh, this school feeding because if I don't take care, I'll die and leave my children. How bad is the situation, Madam Juliana? <laughs> it's very, very bad. It's very, very bad. Last year, we went to the... Uh, President, uh, uh, France House, 
we we send the president the letter. We went to uh, uh, this uh, the vice president. We sent him to. We went to Fremont Paris, the chief of staff. None of them, none of them. They have closed their ears, and uh, this is they pretend they don't hear what is going on. Madam Juliana Kujo, uh, thank you so much for joining us in spite of your condition. We pray that all goes well with you. Uh, that's um, Juliana Kujo. Uh, she leads the School Feeding Caterers Association uh, for the Greater Accra region. Siba Alpha, who is the PRO for the Ghana School Feeding Program, was scheduled uh, to speak to us. But at the last minute, um, he's unable uh, to join us. But as and when we get any response, whatsoever uh, from government on this uh, particular situation, both on the supplies and then also the Ghana School Feeding Program. We'll bring that to you. But um, let's focus or still stay on education-related matters because in our Schools of Shame series today, we go back to Kofori, a community in the East Mamprusi municipality of the Northeast region where education has ground to a halt following the collapse of the school building there. The mud building that was already in a deplorable state and served as classrooms for both primary and junior high school children collapsed after a rainstorm swept through the community. The storm also led to the death of the boys prefect of the junior high school who was struck by lightning. Joy News uh, in the community found that classes are now being conducted under a tree as local authorities are yet to visit the community after more than two weeks since the incident occurred. Correspondent Ilya Sotankuel has been there. Here's At the Kufuri Basic Primary and Junior High School in the East Mamprusi Municipality of the Northeast Region, the time is about 10 a.m. The first lesson for the day was just about to begin when the teachers observed the clouds gathering, a clear sign of rains on its way. Quickly, the people are asked to go home before the rain starts. According to the teachers of the school, this has been the norm and reality in the school since the start of the rainy season for a very long time. The lack of teachers and infrastructure, including teaching and learning materials, has led to the provision of poor quality education for the children of Kufuri and its surroundings. The situation has gone from bad to worse following the collapse of the junior high school block, which was already in a dangerous condition and on the verge of splitting apart. The deplorable school block was collapsed by a violent rainstorm that hit the community on the 4th of this month. The violent storm also caused the death of the boys' prefect of the school. Speaking to Joy News, the people mourned the death of their school prefect as well as the collapse of the school building and plead with the education ministry to intervene to rebuild their school and provide teaching and learning material. Last month, one of the rain came and collapsed your building. But now it was going to bleeding again. So we have to give, we have to give a uh, government message that we have to give us a fresh building for us to sit and learn well. Last thing we for after half on the school, the tender strike, their SP, even though it was not in school, but because they are friends, they always feel whenever they come to school and look at them, they are only men. Some of the parents who are already uneducated and appreciate less the essence of education have started withdrawing their children from the school to help them with farm work and into other ventures. The leadership of the community is worried that education in the community is on the verge of a total collapse. We have nothing to do again, but we have tried since 2003 up to today. We don't get any single block and we don't know how to do. We beg, 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 we don't know whether the government has been forget about it or we anoint us. We don't know. But we would like to beg the government. Nama Kufadu said we should look at it. Everywhere, every community, they are beg. We hear Nasoli here, this is. College here, Sere is here. They are beg all the schools. Why are we? We are the Sere people. Why? What are, not, what are we done we to them, to them, to them bad people? That, that I mean, you see more people this is. Never. We don't know why we are done to them. They just cut us off. Elias Sutanko reporting from Kufuri in the East Mamprasi municipality for Joy News. Well, back to Accra, and uh, we'll be going for business shortly. But first, 
lecturer and member of the NDC, Professor Michael Pesa White, has been cited for contempt by the Supreme Court. This borders on a series of tweets made by Professor White on May 19. The summons issued alleges that he made series of comments which the court considers to be scandalous. Legal Affairs Correspondent Joseph Akable uh, joins us via Zoom uh, with more on what we are learning about this particular issue. And uh, Joseph, do we know the specific tweets he's alleged to have made? A number of tweets are reproduced in the documents that have been filed against him. The first one here uh, reads, the highest court of the land has been turned into, quote, stupid court. Another one here says, they have succeeded in turning the Supreme Court into a stupid court. Common sense is now a scarce commodity. A major ele element in a death of democracies is partisanship in a delivery of justice. And the final one, our judges and need lessons in political philosophy and ethics. Time will tell. Now, per the summons that have been filed, it makes the point that uh, he should appear before the court on May 30 and show cause why he should not be cited for contempt of court, for one, scandalizing the Supreme Court, two, bringing the, the into ridicule, the dignity, respect, and stature of the Supreme Court, and finally, inciting prejudice against the Supreme Court. And what explanation has Professor White offered uh, regarding these tweets? And so first, he makes the point that uh, he was actually reading a specific book. Uh, the book is entitled um, The Most Dangerous Branch Inside the Supreme Court's Assault on the Constitution and Recent Attempts by Some Democracy. So it's a United States book authored by one David A. Kaplan. That's the book that he says he was reading. Now, his statement reads, continues, I have observed that Ghana Web and other media publications sought to associate my tweet with the decision of the Supreme Court in their sin not matter as stated on the face of the summons to show cause. But honestly, at the time of my tweet, I had no knowledge of the Supreme Court's decision as at 9.59 a.m. when I did the tweet. The said tweet was, which has resulted in the invocation of the Supreme Court's power for me to appear to show cause because the tweet has scandalized the apex court of our land has and has brought the dignity into disrepute. Sincerely, the tweet was not done with the intent to scandalize or denigrate a revered institution such as the Supreme Court of Ghana, for which I have tremendous amounts of respect and admiration for. These are consequences I never intended, although I do accept responsibility that I could have exercised better judgment in my choice of words. Please permit me to unequivocally I state that I have no reason to slander our Supreme Court, and I hereby sincerely apologize unreservedly for any pain and discomfort my tweet may have caused at the Chief Justice, the Supreme Court, and the entire judiciary, and signed by Professor Michael Professor White. And so he makes the point that he was reading a book uh, authored by United States citizens about the Supreme Court, uh, which led him to make those particular tweets, but he nonetheless apologize to the Supreme Court of Ghana for these comments. Well, clarify for me, Joseph, do we know if um, this particular apology or public apology has been actually sent uh, to the Supreme Court? From what we understand, uh, it's been issued publicly and efforts will be made to uh, make it available to the court between now and uh, May 30 when he's supposed to show up uh, with his lawyers on that particular day. That's legal affairs correspondent Joseph Akable. Thank you so much uh, for uh, giving us uh, those updates on Professor Michael Professor White and those tweets. And he has since apologized even before the day he's to show up at the Supreme Court. And that's May 30. Let's do business. George, we are faking no apologies um, to offer. Okay. Wear your headset as well. Okay. What's your business? Interesting developments, MFA. Mm -hmm. Always. Well, coming up in business, financial locations for social intervention initiatives expected to be increased on the IMF program to deal with the expected shocks on the vulnerable and government misses out on meeting total revenue and grant target for first quarter of this year. However, cash deficit slows to almost 7 billion Ghana cities. The Business News on Newsnight is brought to you by MTN Business. Welcome to the new world of business, Allianz Life and Ghana Pay. Isn't life wonderful when everything worth doing is scheduled? Hitting the stop button on your alarm just in time for your morning joke. That happy moment listening to your baby's heartbeat at the doctor's office. 
or an arranged virtual meeting with that big client. Buy airtime ahead of time with scheduled airtime service on MTN Momo. You can schedule your airtime purchase of any amount daily, weekly, or monthly by dialing star 170 hash option 3 and follow the process. Or simply dial star 170 star 311 hash for a superb airtime purchase experience. You enjoy 100% bonus airtime anytime you recharge yourself with MTN Momo. Keep on talking with that 100% feeling. So, what are we doing today? MTN. Son, we are so proud of you for setting up this hospital. I really love those hospital beds and waiting chairs. By the way, did you import them? No, Dad, I didn't. I actually got them from Kindle Books and Stationery right here in Ghana. Wow. We also bought our office supplies, safes, executive desks and chairs from Kingdom, and they gave us expert advice on how to set up our office. Guys, that makes three of us. I also got our sofa and bedroom sets, plus our dining hall furniture for our new home from Kingdom. Wow, Mom, that makes four of us. I usually get my stationery items from Kingdom. And my teacher also mentioned that our classroom furniture was provided by Kingdom. So there you have it. Whenever you're thinking about setting up an office or acquiring furniture for your home, etc., Kingdom Books and Stationery should be your first point of call. With over 40 years' experience in the industry, we stock and supply a wide variety of globally sourced office and home furniture, stationery, and equipment. Visit our head office, Osu Akwaje, or our office near the Osu Stadium. We're also in Tema Committee 1, opposite Olam SHF, Kumase K and USD campus. You see Cape Coast and now at the Marina Mall Airport City or call us 0302-764101-764209 or 7627792. Visit our website www.kingdomgh.com. During a shopping experience, does your heart beat fast when you make a payment? Followed by a tight squeeze in your chest when you receive a debit alert? Then you suddenly get sweaty when you see what's left in your account? <laughs> now, you can get more out of paying by tapping into rewards with Visa. Enjoy 10% cash back on 1,000 Ghana cities spend or more in at least five contactless transactions so you can enjoy more of the things you love. Tap to pay with Visa everywhere you want to be. You welcome back to business on Newsnight. And government ended the first quarter of this year failing to hit its total revenue and grants targets. Now, this was captured in a new Bank of Ghana data covering government's fiscal operations in the first three months of this year. We have details in this report. The report showed that from January to March this year, total revenue and grants stood at 26 billion Ghana cities against the 33.6 billion Ghana cities that has been programmed by the finance ministry. On the other hand, government recorded a cash deficit of almost 7 billion Ghana cities ending March 2023. This was against the target of 18.5 billion Ghana cities. In terms of what it was hoping to record in the first quarter of 2023, government ended the first three months of this year spending 32.7 billion Ghana cities. This was, however, lower than the program target of 52 billion cities. It is not clear for now whether the challenges in getting the required revenue for the first quarter impacted on government expenditure for the period. According to the Bank of Ghana, the finance ministry is planning to finance the deficit from domestic markets, but raising the required taxes and issuance of treasury bills. And that is a business dex report. Now, the value of Ghana's economy in monetary terms witnessed some significant increase from last year. It is now worth 873 billion Ghana cities ending March this year, compared to the 610 billion Ghana cities recorded in December last year. There isn't any official communication from the Ghana Scout Service as to what caused this huge leap. The development could impact positively 
on Ghana's debt when it comes to working out the debt to GDP ratio. Now, President Akufado has given the firm assurance that Ghana will be able to meet the new requirement for cocoa exports into the EU market. The country's cocoa beans risk being banned by EU in the coming months unless Ghana is able to get child labor out of the production chain and check deforestation. But speaking at a program in Qatar, the president noted that they are taking steps to protect Ghana's commodity while exploring new markets. I have no doubt that we will meet the requirements of the EU legislation. Do you, is um, the EU critical, though, to, to the success has, of Ghana's the, the, the EU has posed some questions. We have done our best to respond to it. Several meetings have taken place both in Accra and in Brussels to explain the, the topography of the Ghanaian industry, to show exactly what is. We are confident hmm. that uh, the allegation the child labor forms an important part of, uh, of our cocoa, but it's not an allegation that has any foundation in fact, and that we will, when the legislation is uh, enacted, that we will meet the requirements of the legislation. We're very confident Are you willing that. to look to other markets, though, to not be so reliant oh, on you absolutely. or other products? Oh, absolutely. Apart from ramping up the products, there are the, the Asia represents a new huge market, both India and and, and, and China itself and uh, other parts of Asia, they all represent a, a huge new market. And we're making systematic efforts to introduce Ghanaian cocoa into those markets. President Akufuadu engaged in a moderator at the Qatar Economic Forum. Now, human resource practitioners across the country has been asked to show interest in national issues. Now, President of the Chartered Institute of Human Resource Management, Ghana, Dr. Edward Kopom, said practitioners should be more professional in their line of duty. At the launch of his book dubbed HR Thought Leadership, he also called for proper regulation of the sector. We hear a lot of professional bodies commenting on national issues. Ghana Medical Association, the Ghana Bar Association, and the Chartered Institute of Accountants commenting on national issues. But HR is always quiet. We don't want to hurt anybody, so we hold back. And therefore, our value is not appreciated, isn't it? After the measure of a number of banks in this country, redundancies were carried out, packages were not paid, and the matters ended up in National Labor Commission and the law courts, and HR never said a word. So who is protecting workers? Who is serving as a shepherd? of workers. So then what is our role as HR practitioners and as a profession? Dr. Edward Capone is the president of the Chartered Institute of Human Resource Management. Now, government is expected to increase the financial allocation for social intervention programs in the coming months under the IMF program. Now, this is part of measures to deal with the expected shocks that the IMF program will bring on the vulnerable in society. Dr. Lindro Medina is the IMF representative to Ghana, and he has been speaking in an interview that will be aired on PM Express Business Edition tonight, 9 p.m. on Joy News. We expect a large and front-loaded fiscal consolidation. This will be done through revenue mobilization and also through making expenditure more efficient. But, of course, this will be done while uh, protecting the, the, the vulnerable, protecting the poor, uh, because ensuring social protection is one of the key aspects of the uh, program. And if I may uh, give you two examples, two key examples of, of what is being done by authorities in, in, in their uh, economic program, is uh, first, in the 2023 budget, the uh, benefits under the LIP are being doubled and also the uh, school feeding program is being adjusted to counteract the effects of the inflation. But these are just a few examples of what the, the program is doing in these aspects. And are these... Dr. Leandro Medina is the IMF resident representative. Uh, he has been speaking on a yet to be aired uh, interview on PM Express Business Edition tonight at nine. One and two of this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it will be interesting to see the other things that will come up during this program. Interesting development about the, the funds, the perspective about the program, mm -hmm. the bit about getting Parliament's approval, Don't and the, the bit away. that. <laughs> so join us at 9 p.m. on Joy News Channel on Morty TV to the stock market. If you are a shareholder in Enterprise Group, the value went down 
by 27 pesos and it's now worth two Ghana cities 43 pesos for fat milk again 10 pesos and it's now worth one Ghana city 20 pesos and that's all for business on news night thank you very much george um let's do some of your messages uh, that you've sent in uh, this one from nana spintex road says uh, for goodness sake this free education must stop is one of the reasons we are at the imf uh, we are all suffering currently for a not thought through decision and we have uh, senna also says in fact i'm uh, um, listening to madame juliana and he talks about how sad um, he is about the situation and that they must immediately uh, pay them their due. And uh, this one from Kwesi Kaswa says, all these challenges in our educational sector is very much evident that this government is insensitive to education in Ghana, shortage of food and collapse of school buildings here and there. And Kofi Seidu says, is it not sad that President Ekofado cannot pay 97 pesos per child to feed our children in the basic schools? Some of your messages. Uh, we stay on the judicial front uh, because before we went on the break, we're talking about uh, that um, apology from Professor Michael Pesa White. But the Ghana Bar Association is tonight urgently appealing for government intervention as the ongoing strike by members of the Judicial Service Staff Association of Ghana, JUSAC, continues to cripple the delivery of justice in the country. The strike initiated by JUSAC is a response to the government's failure to address the long-standing issue of salary review and other pressing concerns of its members. The grievance of JUSAC members have also reached a tipping point, leading them to abandoned posts. The impact has been far reaching. Let's uh, do a quick check of some regions, and my colleague Martina Bugri um, joins us on the line. Martina, uh, what was the situation today, you'd say? Um, the situation in the northern region was a deserted court. Just a few people who had not heard of the declaration of the strike turned up to work. But when they got there and understand that they had been asked not to work, they also left. So by 9 o'clock, the court premises was empty, except the security personnel who was there to tell people what was happening. The whole place was very quiet. A few people who were still hanging around, hoping that some miracle or something happens, complained of how they had traveled far and near to come and uh, to court, only to be told that the courts are not working and they don't even know when um, they are going to resume. So some were actually not too excited about the news, especially cases they deem were agent cases. And uh, I've come all along to file a case. And when I came, the place is all locked, that they are on strike. And the strike is that uh, there are no paying the allowance. All along from Saboba, I've, I've come, I've, I couldn't file, and I will go back and come back another time. One of our clients just came this morning to do a necessary file, which is the case is supposed to come on 2nd June. Now, in the greater Accra region, many more people were stranded at the court complex. Many returned home disappointed. We are, we are, virtual, we are frustrated, completely frustrated, because now you don't even know when your, 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 your case is coming on. Some of us have dates for trial, certain days, one, two, three, four, five days continuously for trial. And you don't know when again your, your turn will come. It's very, very frustrating. They have to resolve those issues because if they don't do that, there are a lot of cases which they need to be settled. In my case, for example, I have to travel, but because of the case, I'm here. So if it, uh, it's not resolved, then it means we are piling up the cases, piling up the cases, and it's going to be a problem for some people. Well, I'll take you to the Ashanti region. Now, Nana Bwachi Yadom has been doing the rounds all day today. And Nana, we know that the announcement came earlier yesterday. Did we get many people still trooping to the court premises? Uh, well, MFA, yes. A lot of people were trooping into the court premises. Uh, some of these court premises that we visited, the court complexes in the Ashanti region, including the Kumasi High Court, and the appeal court visited. Um, some people traveled all the way from the western region and from Abuase and from the Pai, but unfortunately the court was not open for them. Um, we were able to speak to the regional chairman of the Ghana Bar Association, Kwame Uso Fetre, who says government must intervene and find an immediate solution um, to ensure that judicial service staff return to work. Well, he says the absence of JUSAC will negatively affect every court activity. Um, some of these um, court users were also stranded. Some even came as early as 6 a.m. Um, some 
other person we spoke to had to come for his final ruling today, but unfortunately, um, the court wasn't opened for him. Some court users who were left stranded want um, Jusak to rescind their decision. So, for my monitoring today, MFM, this is what we can report for you. Today, today I'm very sad and because I've traveled all the way from Sashiba quite to far papers in this court. And to my surprise, we heard the news yesterday night. It was very late, so we thought they were not going to implement it. But to our surprise, it's in full implementation that they are not going to work. Well, we can hear from the uh, regional chairman of um, the Ghana Bar Association, Kwame Osu Setre. He wants government to intervene. Yeah. I'm worried in the sense that it's affecting administration of justice in the region. If the strike is nationwide, then the nation. But this morning, for instance, we have a lot of cases that we're supposed to do. We have to file processes that has to be done so that you file it within time because the proceedings and everything is regulated by law. When you want to file any process, there is a specific time limit within which to file. So you come here, you want to file, and it's not there. What happens to that process? And then those who are on remand, who are supposed to even be brought to court, for them to get justice by way of application for bail and others, they cannot come. So what happens is that uh, people's rights will be affected. And it's a, a very serious thing that we, we, we have to find a way of resolving so that these people can come back for us to uh, continue with the... Uh, administration of justice as far as the region is concerned. Well, that's the regional level. The PRO of the Ghana Bar Association, Savia Kuja, says they are taking steps to resolve the issue by Monday. Hopefully, hopefully Monday we should see some action. Why I am saying that the best people to deal with this is JUSA as well as government because they are the main people involved. So they should engage each other. And as I said, let me read three. They don't necessarily be asking that pay them now. They're asking for approval. If that is done, Definitely timelines regarding uh, regarding payment uh, with sincere promises. I believe that they will come because they are reasonable people. They have relatives who use it. And this is where they make a living. Mm. Uh, your members, are they beginning to reach out to national leadership over how this uh, strike is affecting them? Well, uh, it's natural. Of course, you have a few calls as to what's happening. That's what I said, we're in behind the And very soon we'll see results. But That's um, Savia Kuje is the... PRO for the Ghana Bar Association. Thankfully, we have the General Secretary of JUSAC, Abdullah Yakubu, joining us. We are grateful for your time here on Newsnight. Abdullah, uh, did I lose Abdullah Yakubu on the phone? Uh, let's try again. Mr. Yakubu, can you hear me? Good evening. Good evening, Emma. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thanks for asking. Um, do we have some good news for litigants? Oh, as at today, we don't have anything much to report except to confirm that our members across the country have complied with our directive for the strike. It has been effective. And approval has still not been given by government? We, we have not got any official communication from government yet. How about unofficial communication? What do you have? <laughs> we have had a, a bit of engagement with our management, and we're hoping that next week we will meet them and possibly meet the government side also to look at the way forward. So at least um, you've been reached out to since the declaration of the strike? By our management. By your management and not government yet. How about the NLC? Not yet. We've not had communication from NLC. And we hope that they don't come in because they know where the solution is. Our management can work with government to engage us to get the approval. That is all. Mm, why are you not hoping that the NLC will come in in this? Oh, I think we all know what the solution is. So when they are coming, they are, are they coming to give us the approval? They have made their orders for the chief of staff and the labor minister, finance minister, to comply. If they have failed to comply with their, their directive, then they should direct their guns or their weapons towards the presidency or the people that they have asked to engage us to have this matter resolved and not to us again.
Okay. Ms. Abdullahi, I'll leave you here for now. And this is a matter that you'll be interrogating further. But thankfully, the Executive Secretary of the NLC, Ufuswa Samwa, uh, joins us on the line. Thank you so much. Um, they may not want you uh, to intervene. Oh, we, we lost Mr. Ufuswa Samwa, unfortunately. Um, sorry about that. But we're hoping to get the intervention of the National Labor Commission on this. But let's do sport. And Mubarak uh, joins me in studio. Musbao, Musbao, forgive me, Musbao. Yes, I'm <laughs> well, uh, it's, it's just um, former world champion Joshua Clotter, he's been speaking and he's very concerned about the work ethic of some young boxers in the country and uh, he fears that the work ethic might just jeopardize the future of the sport in the country. According to him, too many of these boxers are least concerned about their career and even investing in their skill, rather paying lots more attention on women. This badge, uh -huh. they finish another badge, uh -huh. they finish, maybe we have a future. Uh -huh. Maybe this badge, if they are serious, but this badge, they are all spending their time with girls. Uh -huh. That's what I'm saying, you know, I know what I'm talking about, yeah. you know. Some people might not like it because I am just digging, digging their problem. By the end of the day, is the fact. Uh -huh. They all have women in their rooms. Uh -huh. I don't believe in those things. Uh -huh. Our time, yeah, you yeah, fire with car to Mala Joshi. You have been from Mala Joshi to airport. Mm. That time, no more, yeah, M1. You have been joining from Mala Joshi to airport. Mm. Yeah, yeah, training. Wow. And yet, yeah, like these boys, you know, move to me, yeah, training. No? Mm. Maybe future war, but I mean, him. former world champion there. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> He's really concerned about how some of these young boxers yeah. are, you know, focused on women and not you know about their career not sure where he stands on that but he spoke to uh maybe savanyo of uh, adam tv's adam tv on uh the agon agokensi in commerce agokensi in commerce yeah yeah <laughs> so uh the full interview will be on adam tv uh on sunday you can catch it there of course that's all for sports and it's brought to you by pepsi dent herbal and chaco we say ever every, every smile, smile matters. matters thank you very much Ms. Ba. we'll catch you on tv too but she was sexually harassed by a reverend father who is her superior at work she wanted him punished but later withdrew the case from court that is the story of an administrator in the western north region narrated by the regional shraj director eric kuminta at a stakeholder consultation workshop on the development of a new action plan on business and human rights maxo agbagba was there he's more when perpetrators are punished the Western North Regional Director of the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Eric Kumi Inta, sharing some of the cases his office has been dealing with and how the new National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights will help address the problem. It's a case that came, that came to our office and it's involved one of these hospitals. The, the, the Reverend Father, who is the director, Sexually harassed uh, uh, an administrator, mm. and the case came to her after it. In fact, the matter went to court when mm. uh, later on the complainant came and withdrew his case. Uh, case. Mm. And so uh, we had no strength to, as it were, battle the case again because uh, we were going to lack evidence. The National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights, when activated, would deal with a wide range of business-related abuses like poor remuneration, abuse of employees by employers, and different forms of human rights abuse in businesses in Ghana. But the issue of sexual harassment in businesses continues to remain topical at the consultation workshops to gather views that will help in the development of the National Action Plan. Lead member of the drafting of the Action Plan and member of the Steering Committee Victor Broby says when activated, the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights is suspected to name and shame businesses engaged in or abuse rights through a ranking system. We are going to create a business and human rights rating system. In other words, um, Shraj in, um, in conjunction with other stakeholders are going to rank companies on their compliance levels with business and human rights norms. Chairperson of the steering committee, Dr. Sylvia Adusu says, the NAP, when activated, will enhance the protection of rights.
That's Maxwell Agbagba with that report. Now, it's Tech Thursday, and researchers at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology are urging the Ghana Health Service to expand the use of social media platform WhatsApp in antenatal care and delivery services. This comes at the back of a research involving the records of over 34,000 patients in Kumasi, which found a substantial improvement in antenatal care and delivery services with the use of WhatsApp. Love FM's Kwesi Debra speaks with the lead researcher Kwame Sakwad Yesafo for Tech Thursday. During the COVID-19 era, many hospitals in Ghana suffered a drop in antenatal care and delivery services. WhatsApp was therefore employed to urge mothers to attend antenatal care and delivery services. The researchers found an increase in antenatal care from 37% in 2020 to 53% in 2021 and delivery services from 26% in 2020 to 41% in 2021. Kwame Safasa Kodie is lead researcher. Antenatal care service was on the rise due to the use of the mobile health for referrals. Uh, postnatal care declined during that period because the mothers thought that if, if I was exposed and I'm safe, now my child is in, I will not expose my child. So that side declined. Firstly, I recommend that uh, Ministry of Health should get something like WhatsApp Health. They have WhatsApp business. They should get WhatsApp Health so that the security and privacy component of it could be secured. Reporting for Joy News, Kwesi Debra. And that's it for tonight's edition of News Night. All enjoy 99.7 FM, also on Love 99.5 FM in Kumasi. There's more on myjoyonline.com. I am MFA Apau. Personality profile is up next, and we are hosting Dr. Mary Ishen, principal of the Ghana International School. What a conversation we're about to have. Do stay.